If you have a Bible, will you go with me to John chapter 14? Uh, we'll pick up where we left off last weekend. But before we do that, um, this weekend, I actually want to bring you into my world a little bit. I want you to get to know a little bit about me. One of the things I want you to know is that I'm fascinated about people's lives. I, I love learning about them and who they are. And I guess I share this fascination with Dr. Foth, who is uh, one of the best at it. Um, so if we get into a conversation and I begin to ask you a bunch of questions, I'm not trying to fleece you for information. I'm just a little bit curious. Um, last week, I got a chance to uh, spend my vacation time with my grandparents uh, who are in their 80s and uh, my wife and I and our baby girl, Journey, who's eight months old, uh, took a trip down there to, to, to hang out with them. And, and we, we basically had three things that we wanted to get accomplished. One, yeah, we just wanted to hang out with them. Um, two, we wanted them to get to know their uh, great-granddaughter, their, their newest one. And then thirdly, I just wanted to ask my grandparents some questions. I wanted to, to get to know a little bit more about them, and I wanted to uh, kind of dig into some stuff I, I haven't had the opportunity to do before. And so I got a chance to do that in between some episodes of uh, Judge Judy and The Price is Right uh, and Let's Make a Deal. Um, but I wanted to know my, my, my grandparents a little bit more, and so... I learned uh, some fascinating things. My grandmother and I were talking about our neighborhood. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and uh, there's a, a community in South Dade County called Richmond Heights. And that's the community that, uh, that I'm from. And we were talking about how there, at least when, when I was growing up, there were uh, no other ethnic groups outside of black people in that community. And I was telling my grandma, like, I never really thought about it before, and she said, yeah, you know, well, this community was actually built for uh, black people. And so I, I did a little bit of research and found out that this guy named Frank C. Martin, and there is an elementary school in our neighborhood named after him. He was a, a World, World War II veteran who was a white man who uh, purchased this land in this community for black veterans coming back home so that they could have affordable housing. Um, and then in the 70s, uh, this, this elementary school, as, as integration was taken off, they were inviting kids from other neighborhoods uh, to help integrate uh, the school, Frank C. Martin, which was uh, traditionally an all-black school. Then I talked to my grandfather, and man, he just told me all kind of fascinating things that I had never known before. But I asked him about when he first came to Miami. And so he came to Miami in 1955, and uh, he said he came, a friend told him that the jobs were plentiful and uh, he could make a good living. But he said it took him about a week to find a job. And that entire week, he didn't eat not one time. He, he went hungry for a week looking for a job. He finally find one, found one um, down the street at a little diner uh, for $37 uh, a month. I'm sorry, $37 a week um, in 1955. Now, these are truths and facts and different things that I would have missed if I hadn't inquired and I hadn't asked. Um, and it's amazing how much we don't know. It's amazing how much we assume, even with people who are in close proximity to us or people we have the opportunity to engage with um, reg regularly. Uh, so one of the, 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 the uh, get to know you games and icebreakers that I love is called um, Two Truths and a Lie. And so uh, actually what I want to do this weekend is I actually want to play that with you just, just real quick um, because I think it really illuminates for us how much we know and the framing of our perception. So I'm just going to give you three quick things and then you just decide uh, which one you think is not true. <laughs> Number one, um, uh, a lot of times, or I shouldn't say a lot of times, uh, a few times I've been asked uh, if my wife is white because of the complex, complexion of my, uh, my kids and their eye color. So that's number one. Number two, I was a voice major at a performing arts school in Miami, Florida. And then number three, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side was once a high-ranking Bahamian government official. So your guesses are going to be uh, based on either how well you know me or how well you think you know me um, or, or what you perceive about me based on the information you do know. So let me just tell you real quick, uh, number three is not true. Um, my ethnic heritage is Bahamian, 
but um, on my father's side, uh, but uh, he was not a, uh, my grandfather was not a Bahamian uh, government official. Regarding number two, uh, yes, I did go to a performing arts school. Yes, I was a voice major. And one of the more embarrassing facts about my life is my audition song was Wind Beneath My Wings. Yes, by <laughs> Bette Midler. Um, and then regarding number one, um, yeah, my, my babies, all four of them, they, they, are, they came out very, very light, um, gray eyes. And so, yes, I've been asked if my wife is white, and she isn't. Uh, she is indeed black. Um, but, yeah, I guess you uh, could get confused by that if you saw my kids when they were little. Now, this seems like a very, very <laughs> divergent start to the part two of this series, The Way, The Truth, and The Life. Words spoken by Jesus in John uh, 14 addressed to his disciples. Now, I start here, or I started where I started here because Jesus himself is also sharing truths about him and, and who he is and his identity. And the context of what he's saying in this statement, which is the name of our series, uh, is basically Jesus saying, look no further than me. I am the real deal. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. Now, this um, would, wouldn't seem out of the ordinary, or, or would, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for a response to, to someone who doesn't really know Jesus or who doesn't have that much familiarity to say, how so? But I find it interesting that and plausible that Jesus' own disciples are seemingly unsure. And I find it interesting that they have been hanging with Jesus for a minute. A minute translation just literally means, you know, not literally a minute, but, but for a while. And I find it plausible because in the Jewish context, Jesus is saying he is the fulfillment of the Torah, which contained the laws and the ways uh, that people should live. And Jesus came to be the proper interpretation of that, which is what he is saying. So after he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in verse 6, and then uh, verse 7, he says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. And this is in response to Thomas asking the way to the Father, which Dr. Foth talked about last week. Philip then jumps in in verse 8, and he says, just show us the Father, and that will be enough. This is what he's saying to Jesus. In other words, Jesus, this is what we need to be convinced of what you're saying. And listen to Jesus' response as we read uh, verses 9 through 12 in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14. Will you do me a favor and stand for the reading of God's Word? Uh, if you don't have a Bible or uh, a, uh, a device, we'll have the words up for you on the screen. You can just follow along as I read. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this time. We ask that you would just illuminate your truth to us. Speak to us now. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The language in Jesus' response points directly to the previous statement in verse number six, where he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Specifically, I want to zoom in on him saying, I am the truth. Jesus uh, uses words like no in the verses that we just read, believe four different times, evidence, and truly. Now, gnosko is the Greek word for knowledge, and we would associate knowledge with truth. Then you have pistuo, 
which is the Greek word for uh, believe. And that means to place confidence in. And we would associate confidence uh, with trust or with truth. And then we have amen, which is the Greek word for truly. And that means so it is or let it be fulfilled. In our common vernacular, we can say you can take that to the bank. So Jesus is saying, guys, how is it that you are uncertain about me and who I am? Oh, okay, you, you've got questions. Let's just look at my track record, all right? You were there when I was walking on the water towards the boat when you were out on the sea and Peter came and walked on the water. You saw that. You were also there when we were in the boat and the boat began to toss us to and fro and there was a storm and you were afraid and I came out and uttered three words, peace, be still, and the, and the, and the storm uh, subsided. You were also there when there were more than 5,000 people and uh, the people needed to eat and the only food present was a two-piece fish dinner. You saw me turn it into a fish buffet. You were there. You were also there when our dear friend and brother Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was stinking in the grave. And I spoke the words, Lazarus, come forth. And he came back to life. Here's the, here's the thing. Because this might seem crazy to some of us on the surface as well as we're kind of examining uh, how is it that they could have these questions. But, but here's the thing. I don't think any of those things were invalid to the disciples. I, I don't think that uh, they didn't see that as evidence or acceptable. And Philip's pressing of Jesus in verse 8 when he says, just show us the Father, Jesus, and that would be enough I think what it indicates to us is that Philip wanted the truth on his terms. He wanted the truth on his terms. And aren't we all just like Philip? When it comes to truth and trust, we're more comfortable when we control the terms. By the way, this is why we like assurances on the front end of the deal, right? Because those assurances make us feel better about moving forward. They make us feel more confident. They make us feel more protected and secure. And this is a very, very relevant thing for us to wrestle with today, I think, for two reasons. Number one, the last time I checked, we still have the same human condition as Philip and Thomas. We want control and we want the truth and these things on our terms. But then secondly, we are living in an era that some uh, have deemed the post-truth era. And post-truth was the Oxford Dictionary's uh, word of the year in 2016. And post-truth can be defined as this. Objective facts are less influential in shaping opinion than appeals to emotion and or personal belief. In other words, the facts don't necessarily overrule my personal belief and feeling. So, basically, I can go with whatever I feel. There's also research that supports this as well, and this research is saying that people are now looking inward for truth. As a matter of fact, according to Barner Research, almost two-thirds of Americans think truth is relative or it's based on what I feel. And we're seeing this play out in our everyday lives. We're, we're seeing complete mistrust and distrust of the media and elected officials, pastors, teachers, and the institutions that they are associated with. And some of it is because of the abu abuse of power and platform. Other times it's because of what we have personally experienced 
and seen. So the result of this is we turn inward and we look at ourselves or look to ourselves for truth. And then we've got these tribes that we have begun to associate with that align with our ideologies and what we think and what we feel. Certain news stations and certain digital outlets and, and, and these digital tribes uh, reflect what we think and feel and we reject anything outside of it. And Dave Kinnaman, the president of Barner Research Group says, we are now experiencing an erosion of the sacred. And we're finding it harder and harder to trust authorities for guidance, including God. So we have Jesus' disciples here, mainly Thomas and Philip at the forefront, and they're saying, all right, Jesus, listen, we hear you, bro. We listen. We're listening to what you're saying, but check this out. We just want you to give us the term. We want you to give us the truth on our terms. And that will be enough. Now, listen, I'm not even going to hate on Thomas and Philip. Because the truth is, it's more comfortable to walk by sight than it is by faith. I'm not saying or suggesting that it's better. I'm just saying it's more comfortable because the truth of the matter is I would rather prioritize my comfort because I don't wake up in the morning and say hmm I wonder how uncomfortable I can get today or I can be today and this is an ongoing tension in our lives definitely an ongoing tension in our faith journey so there are two points that I want to highlight in this interaction that we have between uh, Jesus and and Philip, and Thomas, and the rest of the disciples, I just highlight these two things, and I'll get out of your way. Number one, believing in Jesus doesn't eliminate doubt. Believing in Jesus doesn't eliminate doubt. There's a guy that I have um, started to become friends with and develop a good relationship uh, I'll just call him Tim, and I had the opportunity to hang with Tim uh, recently and spend some time with, with his wife as well. And uh, this was an opportunity for me to, to ask a few more questions about his life and to get to know him a little bit more. I told you guys I was, I was really curious, and so I was excited about this opportunity. And so I knew a little bit about his story, but I wanted to know a little bit more. I wanted to drill down a little bit. So I listened to him talk about Uh, his life and talk about his faith journey and uh, I knew about where he grew up but but he told me about how he grew up and what he experienced and and what his family was like and and how his dad never told him and his siblings that he loved them when he grew up even to this day. I knew also that Tim was a convicted felon but I didn't know that he hadn't graduated from high school. And those two things alone, being a convicted felon and not graduating from high school, those two things alone are are big enough barriers to prevent one from having a profitable or prosperous life. But Tim has had a pretty good life. And he told me about how he eventually put his faith in Jesus and how uh, that basically hit the reset button on his life. And he's never not gotten a job that he pursued or he wanted. And as a matter of fact, he just got a job that he's dreamed of for a really long time, and he didn't even have to apply. A job that requires a bachelor's degree at a minimum. A job that you don't even blink at as a convicted felon. Tim says to me that I know my relationship with Jesus has been central to what I've experienced. I know it it has been a bedrock for me. Uh, Yet, despite his close walk with Jesus, despite his proximity of relationship, despite all of the open doors, doors that should not have even been open for someone like him, he told me he still has insecurities about the future. He still thinks Uh, about his lack of formal education and his criminal record. He's still uncertain about his career. And that is often the challenge 
for us when it comes to our faith. You see, our faith doesn't allow us to look down the road and around the corner. It also doesn't allow us to control things on our terms. Philip, kind of like Tim, has been walking with Jesus. Philip has been with Jesus literally in the flesh for nearly three years every day. And he still wants more assurances that Jesus is who he says he is. And there are many people who have walked away from Christianity for a similar reason. Because they're looking for the truth on their terms. And either they didn't like the terms or what they experienced misrepresented what they were told. Things that are not true, but we've often heard, uh, some of us who are Christ followers, that Uh, Once you accept Jesus, everything is going to be great. Once you accept Jesus, it's going to be all good. Once you accept Jesus, it's going to be peaches and cream. But I love what uh, our very own Pastor Heather uh, says. She says, Jesus never promised us comfort, but he promised us his presence in the midst of whatever is uncomfortable for us. So Jesus says to Philip, all this time, We've been, we've been rolling together. How about you just hit the rewind button and think about that for a minute. Think about all of the things that you have seen, all of the things that you've experienced. And I think in the midst of our doubt, in the midst of our frustration, in the midst of even delays in our lives, we have to regularly check the record. Because present anxiety will cause us to negate what has been previously true in our lives. And this is why we need to live out our faith in community. Because there are times when we're not going to feel confident. There are times when we're going to feel down. There are times when we're going to feel frustrated and maybe even want to walk away. But our friends, our homies, our family members can, can give us confidence and say, hey, wait a minute. I have seen the evidence. I've seen God work in your life. I've seen all of these things. And, you, and they do for us what I did for Tim. As I told him, I said, Tim, I've seen the hand of God in your life based off of what you told me and what I'm beginning to understand about you. And I don't think that anything is going to be different in the future. So belief in Jesus doesn't eliminate doubt. But this leads me to my second point, though, that intense pursuit of Jesus, though, will produce evidence. Intense pursuit of Jesus will produce evidence. There, there's a, a, a growing number of people um, moving into a category called nuns. And nuns uh, have been uh, described as people who are not affiliated with a religion. 35% of millennials uh, in America, 25% of our general population fall into this category. And they do not attend church. They would say that they're not religious. Um, Some are atheists and some are agnostic. Well, many in the nuns category have walked away from Christianity. And I find it uh, very, very interesting, uh, the main reasons why uh, they have made this decision. Very intriguing to me. The top two reasons. Number one, they question the teachings of Christianity and just religion in general. Basically, we don't know if it's true. We, we don't know if, if uh, as a matter of fact, just complete rejection at, at times that we don't believe that it's true. And then number two, I disagree with the social or political issues that are often uh, related to um, or connected to uh, this particular uh, religion or to Christianity. We, I just don't feel uh, that that is the case or that's true. I also find it interesting that it was not noted that there were responses that went like this. I committed myself to diligent study, practice, and pursuit, and I found no evidence or experiences of transformation in my life. I didn't see that anywhere in the research. By the way, this research was, was presented by Pew uh, Research. But, but there, was, there was no statements that reflected that. And that is a completely different statement than, oh, it just seems questionable. You see, it's hard to be 
uh, definitive or to definitively declare something untrue without rigor in your investigation. Now, I know that you, you can't rigorously investigate everything, and, and sometimes it, it's, it's not possible. So in those instances, we theorize. But here's what I'm getting at. Maybe the nuns have walked away either A, because they haven't put in the effort. It, it's easier to make a surface decision than to get involved. Now, we live in a culture where everything is quick and everything is fast and you can get news and bite size and, and, and we even report things that might be true before they are true. And so we have gotten into the habit of not necessarily wanting or being conditioned to investigate. So it's easy to just not make an effort. Or B, the nuns haven't seen evidence or transformation in other Jesus followers' lives that they've encountered. And my dear friends who are Christ followers, that is an indictment against us. I think this is relevant to Jesus' response to Philip because Jesus is saying, look at my evidence, Philip. Now, Philip has an advantage over us where he was with Jesus in the flesh and he can see these. We have it secondhand through the Gospels. But the bigger thing that I think Jesus is saying is you can have your own experiences. He said, if you believe in me, if you follow my examples, then you will experience what I have done and more. Listen, when it comes to truth and what we believe, it is heavily influenced by our personal experience. And for those of us who have personally experienced transformation in our lives, we cannot be convinced otherwise. Let me see if I can land a plane like this. I grew up in a black Baptist church, and I told you guys a little bit about my grandfather already, and was a deacon uh, in the church for decades. Uh, he's uh, emeritus status now, but uh, I grew up uh, seeing all of the things that, that were done uh, uh, in my church. And uh, for any of you who've had a black church experience, you know uh, it's very colorful. There are a lot of things going on. There, there, there's a lot of, of, of open expression. And, and so I would come home and I would mimic these things and I would, I would practice these things. And I would sing the songs that we were singing. And, and seeing my grandfather uh, up singing some of these songs, uh, I used to love uh, practicing and even singing the songs with him uh, at times. And there was this one little song. Uh, that, that he was singing, and there was a beginning part of, of, of the worship experience that they would sing songs without, without music. And this was related to uh, kind of what they would do on the plantation or, or back when uh, uh, they would gather and, and they didn't have musical instruments. And so they would sing these little songs. And one of these songs is called Try Jesus. And it goes a little something like this. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. I done tried him and he's all right. He be your doctor. Oh, he's all right in a sick room oh he and they would just go on and on and they would they would just continue to add things to and then at the end my grandfather would say you ought to try him and and I used to love singing these songs but 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 this particular song try Jesus was this was this imploring it was this it, this invitation this this desperate asking for for people to try Jesus and this is the essence of what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He's saying, I think there is enough evidence for you to believe that I am who I say I am. But in addition, amen, let it be so that if you do try me and believe me and do what you see me do, there will be proof that I am who I say I am. There will be indeed proof that I am the truth. And that proof will become an anchor in your life when the, the seas of doubt begin to blow. Those, that will become anchors in your life 
when you are unable to, to, to feel like things are going to turn around and, and the uncertainty is blowing in your They will become anchors that will show you and others that I am able to exceed your wildest imagination. So this weekend, I want to leave you with two challenges. Number one, to those who are already believers, but you're telling God the terms of your trust, the terms that you will accept truth. And he's saying, try me. Take a step towards me and really see. It's kind of like my kids saying they don't like anything uh, or like something that they haven't even tried. Jesus is saying, try me and there will be evidence. And then number two, or the second challenge will be to those who are on the fence about whether God is real. You're, you're, you're not sure. Maybe you're on the outside uh, trying to decipher, but you haven't fully tried, or, or, you're, or, you're, or you're, you're, you're just kind of nibbling a little bit. But Jesus is saying the same thing, thing to both the believer and the non-believer. Try me, and there will be evidence. And in a world where there is uncertainty, where a world where people are desperate for the truth, in a world where people are looking for solid footing, Jesus is saying, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. If you try me, you will see evidence. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to be the example to us on how we should live. But there are times when it's difficult to trust. There's times when there are things we don't understand and we're searching for truth and we're looking for certainty. But God, let, it, let our response be to move in closer and not to distance ourselves because we're not getting the truth on our terms. And so, God, for those of us who are believers and those who are, who are trying to follow you, help us to move closer and to not just go through the motions and show up at a religious service on, on the weekends, but to truly pursue you so that there will be evidence that will be encouraging to us and to those around us. And then to the non-believer who's discovering or who's searching, God, I pray that you would illuminate for them who you are. And God, encourage them to take a step towards you so that they can begin to build evidence in their own lives that you are indeed the truth. It's these things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen.